Justin Perry. Hey, Jackie Hill Perry. So this morning, I really wanted you to be here. I felt overwhelmed and out of control. Wow, what happened? So me and Kim were upstairs recording a promo for my upcoming devotional that will be released October 3rd. You can go to UponWakingBook.com to Upon pre-order. Upon Wakening. Upon Waking. Upon Waking. Upon WakingBook.com to pre-order. But anyway. It's a fly behind you. Can I kill it? It's literally right there. Got it. I got that joker. Yeah. This is called a bug assault. It literally kills bugs. Oh, that was so satisfying. Back to God's glory. So, uh... <laughs> That was a lot. I was <laughs> overwhelmed. Uh, I was so I came downstairs to get the book for me to 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 do the promo with Kim or whatever. And uh, what's her name? Sage came over and she hugged me. And then she was like, "Oh, I want to see, I want to see Doggy, I want to see Doggy." And I'm thinking she's talking about Bluey because they were watching Bluey on the TV. And I come over and then I hear I see three dogs. Oh wow. We have one dog named December, but there was one of the men in black dogs in here and somebody else's poodle that came through the garage door and basically they was like, yeah. they was run, running in a circle chasing each other by the butt. <laughs> and and so I'm trying to figure out, because I wasn't going to pick up them dogs because I don't know what them dogs got. I don't know who those dogs are. They might think that I'm a terrorist or I'm like a the, like a, a enemy, so they might bite me. I didn't want no tetanus shot. And so yeah, I, I was know, like- I didn't know this was what she was referring to. Your mom told me about this. I, I was like- I was like, so what am I supposed to do? So I tried to get snacks. The little dogs ain't want no <laughs> snacks. I'm trying to uh, clap and I'm trying to do all the things, but all they want is December. So I said, eat him, pick up December, and let's just hold December while we go outside. So we go outside, they follow us outside, and then as soon as we get outside, they run back in the garage door. So I got to make sure that Tina then shut the garage door so they can't run back up in the house. And so it just was a lot. And I just felt like if you were here, you would have been able to manage the situation in a way that was that was good. But it, I just manage, I didn't I have... just would have just picked them up by the, by the little that back too. of the head and yeah. just... I, I don't know. I don't I didn't know what to do. Yeah, because you know, there's no such thing as bad dogs. Then I'm looking at my, just I'm bad thinking owners. myself, I'm like, do I pray? Like I, I just felt like, like, Lord, do I pray? Because the other day I've been praying about these bugs. I should have prayed about that fly before you tried to shoot it in the back of the head. Because I had got I had landed and went to my car. I don't know if you know, Atlanta been having a lot of dragonflies. Yes, they has. It's like, I don't know. They like, look like, what's those, pterodactyls? That's yeah, what they look like. Yeah, they're Little, huge. They, medium pterodactyls. And it was hovering on top of my car. And I watched it for a minute because I'm like, I'm not walking over there. I literally said this. I said, Lord, get your creation, please. <laughs> and they flew away and they would not come back. And then I felt like rest. I felt like I can even take my time because they are his creation. Like he could be say, a he be could a say lot to of the them. wind of the waves, peace be still. So he can move these dragonflies. Yeah, it'd be a lot of them in a the parking lot at the airport too. Just That's where I was. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But Anywho. yeah, man, as far as the dogs, there's it's no such thing as bad dogs. It's just bad owners. And like, Yeah, but bad just... dogs kill people. No, what I'm saying though, if they have a good owner, like we have a lot of people in our neighborhood, they just got to tighten up with their ownership with their dogs. It's just, it's getting out of hand. What are we talking about? What are we talking about today? I just asked you. I just asked you. Because you don't know. I do know what we're talking about. <laughs> we're talking about preaching the gospel, particularly in the culture that we live in. How do we reach the loss? Yeah, big picture. How how to preach the gospel? What is the gospel? Uh, how to engage culture with the gospel, like Great Commission, like all the things. Because, I mean, that's what we, that's actually part of why we've been redeemed mm -hmm. is to be ambassadors for Christ. Yeah. Um, and so I think there there needs to be some kind of instruction uh, related to like our role as ministers and what that really means. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because people out here just winging it. Oh, yeah, for sure. Before we even talk about that, I mean— I think it's important for us to lay a foundation of what is the gospel. I think uh, we hear the gospel presentation all the time, but you can never hear it enough, mm -hmm. right? When I used to work at uh, this nonprofit in uh, Chicago, I was, so my job was to interview and manage and lead a bunch of volunteers and the vo volunteers were mentors to inner city youth or whatever. Inner city, inner city youth. I don't even like that term because it, it just implies a lot of things. But anyway, 
I, I had added to the interview process because they didn't have this, but I added to the interview process the question, what is the gospel? It was astounding to me how many volunteers who, came, who were Christians who I would ask, what is the gospel? And they could not answer that question. One girl in particular, I said, what is the gospel? And she was like, well, I think, I think it's safe to say that the gospel is like the book of Matthew and, and Mark and, and Luke and John. I was like, those are the gospels. Yeah. But what is the gospel yeah. that they contain, right? And yeah. she couldn't answer the question. And so I think the gospel, and not I think, the gospel is the message of salvation and yeah. what Christ has done yeah. for us. It's good news. All the things. Yeah. Now, how does the gospel begin though? Because I think- That's a we, good question. We have a habit of either going straight to good news but also straight to bad news. But the Bible doesn't actually begin with bad news. No, it doesn't. I, I, yeah, and I, I'm, I'm glad you said that because the gospel story is essentially about the, it's the story of God, mm -hmm. right? It starts off with a good God creating his creation and calling it good. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, I think that's how the gospel starts off. And so I think before we think about the fall of man, right? Because I think a lot of times people, uh, the gospel starts off that we fail from grace. And you know what I mean? And it's like, no, it actually starts off with in the beginning, uh, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was our form and void and the darkness is over. You know, it starts with off with this cr creator creating us. Um, and so um, God created mankind for, for, for his glory, um, for his purpose. And, um, and then after that, that's when the, you know, the, the news kind of gets bad. Well, not kind of mm -hmm. get bad, it gets bad. Oh, it gets terrible. When, when, when we Trashy. sinned against God Trash. in the garden, causing... Horrific, <laughs> tragic, scary, horrible, insidious, diabolical. Okay. Any more? Discouraging. Sinful. Unrighteous. All right. Licentious. <laughs> Licentious, <laughs> you so petty. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. When we when we sin against God in the garden, I mean, causing God in His righteousness to judge the world and judge all unrighteousness. Um, you know, that's when it that's when it gets bad. We fell from His grace. We fell from His perfection. But because He is a holy and a righteous judge, um, the good news is that He's also a loving God. And so he didn't judge the world without first promising to save. And he did so by sending his son into the world who knew no sin to become sin so that we can become the righteousness of God. I want to slow down a, a bit, though, because you just preached the gospel. Because I think it, it could be a habit, again, to go to, to preach the fall first. And I get it. It's just like... You know why you need the good news. You know why you need Jesus, because you sinned against God. Yes. But sin actually only makes sense up against some kind of communication or instruction about the nature of God. Right. Right. And so it is it is it is wiser not to begin the gospel with you are sinful and you are bad, but to begin with God is good. Yeah. Because you only understand sin when you understand righteousness and holiness, yeah. right? Is that you fail from a standard yeah. that God has set in himself. Yeah. He's yeah. good, he's righteous, and Adam and Eve were too, but they wanted to listen to the devil. And I can understand. And here we go. Yeah, and I can understand the pressure that some sometimes people have because we live, especially for people who just want to stay true to the gospel and who don't want to um, be so like grace heavy where they don't give truth. It's mm -hmm. like I think sometimes it can be an overemphasis on the fall because so many people lack truth. And so I think mm. the gospel is a beautiful balance of both grace and truth. And so I think we we want we want so desperately for people to understand you are a sinner. You're this. Right. You're fallen. But it's just like, no, if the Bible message doesn't start off that way, why are you starting off mm. that way? And why, it, like, it, it, under, it undermines God's intentions, though. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Because it, sure. it's really just bad anthropology. It's yeah. like we, we inherited sin but we were not created to be sinful. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And so, so what, so what, like the, the whole idea of even being born again and, and putting on a new nature is that God wants to redeem and restore his original intention for us. Absolutely. Which is for us to mirror and image him. But as, even as, you know, as an evangelist and given the gospel, I used to go to like very atheistic environments or whatever. Atheistic. Come on here. I, 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 I like that. 
<laughs> you you so crazy. Uh, I, I saw the power in in you know letting people under like helping people understand how they were originally created, how mm-hmm. we as a as a as a creation was originally created. How how was it helpful? It was very helpful because I think a lot of times when somebody walk up to a person that's an atheist or agnostic or somebody who's just really cool on God and they understand it that I'm a Christian. I, I, I kind of can see their eyes and their posture. It's like, okay, you're about to preach at me. You're about to tell me how sinful I am. Mm. And so one, it shocks them that I, instead of coming for their sin right away, mm. I, I tell them, no, that you were created with a purpose, mm. that I don't know you, but I know why you were created. That's good. You were created for glory. You were created um, by God who has you in mind. Mm. You were created, you know, with a purpose. Yeah. And because of sin, a lot of us don't know that purpose, but God and his righteousness came to the world to dwell amongst his own creation, to restore us back to yeah. our original state. Yeah. And so I think having a, a framework of, of how the Bible starts helps us even in how we evangelize the world. It's mm-hmm. like, no, a lot of times we can focus on sin and we can miss the fact that God, um, you know, sent his son to mm-hmm. restore us back to what we once were. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. And so, I, I, you know, I've just found it in my personal opinion um, to be powerful when people were like, oh, like, no, like, this is the reason why, mm-hmm. you know, the world is messed up. This is the reason why, you know, mm-hmm. my father rejected me. This is the reason why the church rejected me because, you know, we live in a fallen world, but God wants to restore not only me, but all of mankind. And, you know, and so I, th- I think it gives people a better framework of who God is. And when people have a better framework of who God is, they have a better framework of what they're saying. Mm. Now, yes. when we say fallen, even words like that, have some type of theological context. When you say that, what do you mean? Yeah, we were we were originally perfect. We were originally, you know, um, not perfect. Our first parents. Our first parents. The, the, you know, you know, Adam and Eve, and we were created to 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 mirror and to image God. And I think what happened in the in the fall in the Garden of Eden, we f- we failed. We became so unlike Him because of our sin. And so when it says that every man born after Adam will will, will be born inheriting this particular sin, we were we were we were born with this this propensity to to love the things that God hates and to hate the thing that God loves. Um, and so I think that's what I think that's what fallen is to have a fallen nature. We like the the fall made humanity become so unlike him, which is the reason why Jesus had to come to, to be the propitiation for our sins. And so I, I, I think that's what, in a nutshell, what, you know, being fallen, fallen is. What would you say? I want to, yeah, we, we fell from a standard because uh, I think Romans is top tier when it comes to understanding the gospel and just kind of even the storyline of humanity. For sure. Um, because some people will often, I think I think it can be confusing to even think about how like, yeah, Adam sinned. Why is it, why is it my fault? Mm, right? Like why, yeah. why did I have to be considered sinful when he's the one who did it? But scripture, I think Romans... Five kind of helps us frame this. Romans 5, 12 says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law. And da, 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 da. Verse 14, Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even those whose sinning was not like the transgression of, transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one to come. It's this sense in which there's this theological term for it. I don't remember what it's called. It doesn't even matter. But it's like, if he was our first parent, right, then in the same way that you inherit traits and, uh, you know, ways of being from your father and his father and his father, in the same way, like, he was the first human being. So he set the pattern for what the rest of humanity would be like. Mm. And so because we come in his lineage, we also inherit his sin. That's cool. Um, but we, we, we also have this, like, self-righteousness about us where it's like, if Adam sinned, why am I the one judge? It's like, but you're sinning too. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. you... 
you you still choose to sin. And so you still are very much accountable for what you have chosen to do, even if you didn't sin in the same way that Adam did. Yeah, for sure. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. And I think that's, I think, you know, instead of us focusing on Adam, I think it should really make us focus on, on God because God in his goodness right away uh, right away planned a way of escape for us. You want me to read it? <laughs> Go ahead and read it. That's what it's given. You set me up to read Genesis 3. This is actually, according to theologians, the first preaching of the gospel. Mm. Where is it? So this is right after the fall. You know, God, he goes to Adam and Eve. He like, hey, where y'all at? They like, we hiding because we were scared. You know what I'm saying? The crazy thing about that text, we should do a podcast on the fall. Because, you know, I, I teach the fall do, all the time. I know, but do but you— But I don't think I've ever done a podcast. Do you remember when we wrote the poem, The Fall, when you was pregnant with our first baby? No. What about it? So when we wrote— I was the, pregnant. Yeah, when we wrote the poem, The I Fall— remember. I just remember us reading this over and over. So we would read, and then we go write. We go write, oh, that's good. and then we go read, and then we go write. We go that's write. so godly. I don't remember that. Yeah, I remember it because I was so tired, and we had to finish that poem. We had to finish that poem, like you know, the, like three or four days before we actually had to perform it, and so we didn't know it all oh, the that's way. Terrible. Yeah, it's bad planning. It is bad planning. Um, but it was it was it was good that it that we ran back to the text. But yeah, he asked him, "Where y'all at?" They say we hide behind a tree. What people don't realize is that they knew that God had said, the day you eat of this tree, you shall surely die, right? Mm -hmm. And so that there was going to be, there was going to be some consequence, some judgment um, assigned to them by virtue of them sinning against a just God, right? And so when God walks into the cool of the day in the garden, instead of them going to him, for deliverance from the judgment. They hide behind the tree. Mm -hmm. And what that means is, is that they assume that the tree would be some kind of mediator, that the tree could protect them from the judgment to come. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the beginning uh, uh, I think that's the beginning of our kind of propensity to look to creation to save us from God. That's good. Instead of going to God to save us from God, yeah. which is the gospel. So in Genesis 3, God... He gives curses to Adam, to Eve, and to the serpent. And to the serpent, he says, verse 15, chapter 3, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. Listen, listen, you listening? I'm listening. He, pronoun, shall bruise your head <laughs> and you shall bruise his heel. I'll read it again. I will put enmity, Why war... Why you read like the Hebrew Israelites? Uh, read. That's what you're supposed to say. <laughs> I will put enmity between you and the woman. This is God talking to Satan. And between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you... He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. I think this ESV is not really getting at what God is saying because he says that the... Technically, that the offspring that will come from this woman will not just merely bruise... Mm -hmm. In a, in a way where, like, I injure you. But if I bruise your head, I break you. Yeah. I, I, I render you lifeless, mm -hmm. ineffective, yeah. inefficient, right? And no offspring from the woman was able to defeat Satan because they were just, they were just as, not just as sinful, but they were born under a dominion of sinfulness and humanity that didn't allow them to actually have the moral power yeah. to defeat Satan. Yeah. Because why? Everybody was born in sin except... Jesus. Jesus. So Jesus comes, and we already know that he is obviously the um, the consummate. I don't think consummation is a good word. We know that he's like the promised seed when you get to stuff like Luke 4. Yeah. Because Jesus, he goes into the wilderness. Who, sh who show up? The devil. The devil. And he tempts him with the same stuff. He mm. came to Eve and was like, hey, don't that look good for food, girl? Mm -hmm. What he go to Jesus and say, Hey, I know you hungry. Yeah, make turn those stone stones bread. into bread. He yeah. he he trying to get he, he trying to get Jesus to sin against God with the stomach. Yeah, but he defeats that and he defeats the whole like go up on the mountain and throw yourself down and he defeats the other stuff. And so now like Jesus's victory over sin, his entire life proves that he was the one who had come to crush the serpent's head. Yeah, that's really good. That's really good. And so. 
Yeah, how I would you? Him. How would? Yeah, I love him too. Y'all love God. I love you don't him. love God. What's wrong with what's you? Wrong, what's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I just wanted to know they process of writing that. And it's, <laughs> I love God. With, you don't love God. What's wrong with what's you? What's wrong with you? It, I'm not. Shout out to. I, t- I love Eric and Tina. I love y'all. No, that, 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 those are aunties. But. I love me some Tina. And it Erica. do feel like an auntie wrote that. <laughs> I don't. I don't know if somebody my age. What's wrong with you? Maybe it's how she said it. What's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> we know them. We we actually uh we love them and we know them. So we ain't we ain't coming for Tina. You. C H U. What was we talking about? Um. Yeah. And so I was gonna ask, in light of us kind of laying the foundation of the gospel, how would you say? we should give the gospel not necessarily to Christians, a lot of Christians who might listen to this podcast, but Christians, um, how do how should Christians give the gospel to the culture around them and the outside world? Well, I will. So I do want to add some clarity to the fullness of the gospel, which is God created us good or created human, he created us with the intention to be good in the same way that he created Adam and Eve. They fell from that standard, sinned against God, and therefore God was required to judge them because he's just, right? And then we, we are born in sin and shaped in iniquity. So we inherited that same propensity and desire to love and want everything other than God. And so the problem is we can't work ourselves into God's righteousness. We can't earn it. There's nothing we can do. And so God in his grace, sent Jesus to live the life that we couldn't live and die the death that we deserved. But the gospel doesn't just end with the cross. Yeah. The gospel also has a resurrection attached. Yeah. Because it, it, it means nothing if Jesus then just raised, dies. Right. If he, if he just dies, we're still hopeless. Yeah, if, yeah. if there is no resurrection, we, we still don't have life. And so the fact that he rose from the dead confirms that the Lord, one, accepted his death as an atonement, as a sacrifice for our sins. But it also shows that he has the power over death. And so when he then says, come to me, all who are heavy laden and of burden, I'll give you rest. Yeah. It's like, not nah, in him, I... I can have freedom from sin. In him, I can conquer death. In him, I can bruise the head of the serpent, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But not only that, he also promises his spirit to fill us so that we can walk righteously. And so I think that's a fuller picture of the gospel. Now, how you engage the culture with that, I think, one, the gospel has to, the gospel really has to be something, how do I say it? It has to define you. You know, like, I I don't think you can engage culture with the gospel if the gospel isn't a part of your own identity. Mm. Explain that. Explain what you mean. So, really practical example. When I started to be discipled, before being discipled, I was probably, I was 19, new to Jesus, and I went to a church, I've said this before, that really esteemed gifts a whole lot. And so, because I'm gifted, they esteemed me, gave me all this honor, all these things, but they weren't discipling me. They weren't showing me how to read scripture. They weren't showing me how to like walk worthy of the yeah. calling to which I, be ca- I had been called. And I was struggling just in my mind and my heart with sin and immaturity and lack of wisdom. And Santoria, when she started to disciple me, I came to her to tell her about how I was struggling with this particular lust issue. And she was like, Jackie, what you need to do is you need to meditate on the gospel. I'm like, what? Because again, I'll come from a context where I'm thinking she's going to tell me to fast. Yeah. To to tarry, to to go get some hands laid on me, which is helpful. But for her to say meditate on the gospel, that didn't seem like power. Yeah. That, wow. didn't, that didn't seem good enough. And I'm like, why would I do that? And she mm-hmm. was like, because this is what she said. She said, the gospel didn't just save you. The gospel also keeps you. Yeah. You have to continually remind yourself what Jesus accomplished on the cross for your sin. And there is where your power is. Yeah. And so that's what I mean by it has to define you. That Like if the gospel is not a part of your daily meditation, yeah. if the gospel is not a part of how you do life and why you do life, then it's not going to show up in your ministry. Yeah. It's just not. What's going to show up in your ministry is works. What's going to show up in your ministry is, 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 is legalism. What's going to show up in your ministry is even... Um, um, the other end of that, which is, uh, 
licentious this low, low key. Yeah. Where it's like God loves us, so you know, we could just kind of do whatever we want to do. No, the gospel centers you where it's like, no, I, I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. There is grace, but there's also a response That's to what good. Christ has done, which is holiness. That's good. That's good. And because I think what what I hear you saying, and which I had to fight with early in, on in my in my Christian walk is I think a lot of times some some church coaches try to push us to how to we how, how to obtain a particular power, but it, mm-hmm. it it really is about reminding yourself of who has the power Come on. and who you are in, yeah. right? Um, because that's what that's what's going to sustain us. Because a lot of times we just lose sight of Jesus, yeah. that He came and defeated all sin, that He was the propitiation for our sins, which means what's propitiation? Propitiation means the process in which God's wrath has re- has been removed from us, mm-hmm. right? And so, like because of our sin and rebellion against God, God's wrath was upon us. And so, it isn't that God's um, God stopped being loving when we sinned. He's mm. always loving, just like the sun is always consistent, right? Mm. But 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 if we go if we go outside and all we see is utter darkness, it isn't that the sun isn't shining. The sun is consistent; it's always shining. It's just the earth has to rotate, Come causing on. the sun to shine on us. And so, <laughs> Jesus being the propitiation for our sins. Where you get that metaphor? I ain't never heard you do that. Maybe it's the Lord, but Jesus. You just be- made that up. No, <laughs> I I'm, thought, I'm, I'm, I'm cutting it too. I, I, th- I thought about it before, but uh, yeah, but that's what that's what propitiation is. It's it's literally like Jesus being the propitiation for our sins is a process in which Jesus came, took the full wrath of God in exchange, gave us His righteousness, uh, and took our unrighteousness. And now God's consistent and holy love is being able to be shifted upon us, taking us out of darkness and bringing us into His marvelous light. And so, like. I think when we meditate on the fact that like, no, who I am in Christ is a position and maybe Mm -hmm. I'm struggling in my walk because I have not meditated and reminded myself of who I'm in Mm -hmm. and who has the power, right? Mm -hmm. And all power is in the right hand of Jesus. And so I think meditating on the gospel gives us the confidence to to walk righteous and holy before God. I would would think that how we read the Bible— informs our ability to actually meditate on the gospel more often than we do, right? Because it, I was trained to read the Bible looking for Jesus, looking for what he did, looking for what he accomplished, just, just with an eye to him. And so when you do that naturally, then you're always going to be pulling gospel into your heart. You know what I'm saying? Or like even being around people who would like push the gospel in in gospel conversations. So I guess for you, when you were learning how to be a disciple, like what was that process for you of getting the gospel in you so that when you so that when you did start to evangelize, it wasn't you trying to preach the gospel. It actually just came out. Well, experience, I feel like in a lot of times is the best best teacher. I think a lot of times we um we kind of get this routine of what we feel like people should need. But for me, uh, it was it was knowing the gospel, but also being sensitive to the Holy Spirit and what he wanted me to say with each individual. And so I think for 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 me, it was it was each conversation that I entered. It's like, I know the gospel, but God, what do you want me to say um to this particular person? And and how and how do you want me to introduce the gospel? Um, well, that's a different answer to my question. Okay, what's what's your question? My question was, what were I don't remember, but I was trying to get at what when you were learning how to be a disciple in your early days. What were the experiences that shaped you to be a gospel centered Christian? That's what I'm saying. Oh, uh, what were the experience that shaped me to be a gospel centered Christian? Was it books? Was it uh, you fell in sin and somebody was like, hey, man, Christ died for you. Get uh, yeah, up. for me, I, I honestly think um, um, just being refined by the Holy Spirit, like like the God in his sovereignty, allowing me to go through things, um, to, to seek him in ways that I wasn't seeking him before. So I think sovereignty, but I also think discipleship. I honestly think being discipled, you know, Help me to become a better disciple. Like how I came to Christ is just it's it's so it's so um 
yeah, a lot of times I think people need to see like holy and righteous, you know, examples of strong Christians. But I, the the dude who was discipling me, I literally saw more failure, and through his mm-hmm. and through his conviction. Mm. Uh, it showed me that I wasn't a Christian, mm-hmm. right? And so that's how you know um, I became a Christian, and 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 being a disciple, like you know, my disciple is telling me, like, man, this is how you seek the Lord. This is how you read your Bible. This is how you love your enemies. And so for me, what taught me how to be a good Christian is being around men of God, um, and like literally seeing them doing life. And so mm-hmm. th- I think the scriptures kind of like lay, lay, lay a foundation of how we should um, do life with people. When Jesus is, um, when he runs into um, two of the disciples in the, in the, in the, the book of Acts, I think, um, he's walking past John the Baptist with his disciples and they follow Jesus and they say, Jesus, where are you staying? They wasn't asking Jesus, where is he staying? Because they want to see his house look like, right? They were saying, Jesus, we want to see how you live. And so them following Jesus, them like shadowing Jesus like literally taught them how to be disciples. Mm. And so in Jesus's time, that's actually how people learn, right? That's- Notice how they didn't say, Jesus, where are you preaching at? When is the next conference? <laughs> it was like, no, Jesus, we want to shadow you to see how you live. And so that's how I learned how to be a disciple, following great men of God. I think that's an excellent, uh, excellent pivot into even a conversation about engaging the world around. Like, because, okay, so you have the Great Commission, right? Mm. You have Jesus, uh, before he ascends, he comes down. Matthew 28 tells his disciples, hey, by the way, go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and I will be with you always, right? And so there's this sense in which to be a disciple of Jesus means that you must be going out and making other disciples of Jesus and teaching them to obey everything that Jesus did. But to your point, I think it is so natural for us to think that preaching the gospel is just about giving people instructions when it's actually also inviting people into our world. Mm -hmm. Because that's what you just said. Yeah. Is that Jesus... What he say? They asked him where they live. Yeah, they Jesus was walking past, and they walked. They followed Jesus, and then Jesus turned around and says, "What are you seeking?" Mm-hmm. And they said, "Jesus, we uh, where are you staying?" And he he says, "Follow me." Yeah. You know, and so when you even when you look look up uh, where are you stand in, in in the original language, is literally saying, "We want to see how you live." Yeah. And so that's how rabbis actually taught mm. in Jesus's day. Mm. You know, they followed and they shadowed, right? And so I think in our time, we 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 try to follow disciples by saying, "When is your next conference? Mm-hmm. When is your next event? Mm-hmm. When is your next IG live?" And that's cool, but you need you actually need people in your local context who you who can invite you into their life because. People can teach you theology all day, but we un- we underestimate the power of watching somebody love their enemies. Yeah, we under we underestimate the power of watching somebody get into an argument with their with their spouse and then coming back and say, you know what, I'm sorry. Can yeah. you forgive me? Yeah, and so that's what I saw. I saw Brian get snappy with his wife and then, you know, leave with me and then feel feel convicted. You know, when we out eating and saying, I got to go home and apologize to my wife. That taught me how to be a disciple. Yeah. And so he can teach me all the theology in the world, but if you don't have people in your life walking with you, teaching you how to how to how to not just learn theology, but to apply theology. Mm-hmm. You or know. vice versa. Um, because I don't want people to hear you say that engaging culture is always following somebody. I yeah. think that's a factor. Yeah. But it's also the sense in which we should. We should actively be being poured into, but we should be pouring out. Absolutely, right? yeah. Um, because I think we're all in a position of process where, like, people can feel like, "Well, I don't know enough." Yeah. Right. Like, so, so, what do you even say to that person who is like, "I want to fulfill the Great Commission, but I don't feel like I know enough of what Jesus has said to even go out and make disciples." Yeah. The, notice how when Jesus says, "Therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit," goes on to say. Therefore, I'll be with you to, to the end of the age. This word make impro- implies that it's a process. So I think a lot of times when we think about making disciples, we think about um, what can I say? 
Mm-hmm. What kind of what, what's the what's the quickest word I can give to change somebody's heart? But mm-hmm. this is like no, this make means that it's a it's a it's a process, and so like in this process, we have to understand that Jesus wants us to proclaim the gospel, but also Jesus wants us to display the gospel. And I think displaying the gospel, you don't have to know the whole Bible; you just have to love God with your whole heart, mind, body, soul, and strength to love your neighbor as yourself. Mm-hmm. Don't underestimate the power of that. Mm-hmm. I, I think I think people really underestimate the power of truly living out a life worthy, right? And I, and I hear people say, um, preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. I really don't like that saying. Mm-hmm. Because because it implies that that if we just preach the gospel, uh, if if we live a life holy and righteous, uh, we don't necessarily have to proclaim the gospel with our with our words. Mm-hmm. No, the Bible says that no man can can know God if they don't hear nobody preach, yeah, right? Yeah. And so we need to we, like they need to hear truth in order to change. But I think we should say um, uh, live a life holy and righteous in front of people, so that when we do preach the gospel, it has more impact. That's good. And so, like, I think having a, uh, yeah, I think people think that they have to know a whole bunch of information mm. in order to be effective. Mm. And it's like, no, the old saints didn't know uh, what presuppositional apologetics was. Mm-hmm. They didn't, they didn't know these big seminary words, mm. but they knew how to love God and they yeah. knew how to love people. I think a, a prime example of this is in John Chap. I want to guess it, but I don't know. I think it's four. It is. Look at that. The woman at the well. When Jesus reveals himself to her as the Messiah, right? She goes, leaves her water jar, goes into the town. And this is all she says. Hey, y'all. I just met a man who told me everything about me that I ain't never... You you know what I'm saying? Like, I just met somebody who told me everything that I ever done. Many people refer to her as the first evangelist. Could this be? Not he is. Yeah. Could this be the Messiah? Messiah, yeah. It says that they left the town, went after Jesus, and many of them followed him because of her testimony. Mm. Notice how simple it was. Yes. And notice that all she was able to share was all that she had at the moment, and God still used it. Yeah. And so I think there's some encouragement in saying, no, whatever season you're in and whatever level of knowledge you have, trust that, like, like look at Gideon. That's what God does, is that he does a whole lot with a little. He, yeah. he really don't need you to be this beast of a theologian to use you unless he's calling you to do so. Now, yeah. that ain't to say that you don't study your Bible. That ain't to say that you don't get as much of it in you as you can. But it is to say that whatever level of knowledge you have in the moment is still good enough for God to use. Quick plug. I just finished my book. Okay. Day before yesterday. All right. And literally, like in a nutshell, like the like it's three chapters that's in my book that's kind of centered around this. Mm-hmm. It is, I think people think they have to be a jack of all trades. Um, but like we end up being a jack of all trades and a master of none. And the 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 gospel message is sufficient. Um, it's a story I I don't I don't know where I, where I read it at, but um we know the the um, the apostle John was the last apostle, living apostle. And um, I think it was Stratulian or one of the, the old church fathers who told this story about how, you know, they would carry John from city to city to church to church and people will flock all over in his, in his old age to hear John preach. Now, this is the man who gave us John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Like, he, like, literally talked about the deity of, deity of Christ. And the book of John is so deeply steeped in, like, theological, mm-hmm. you know, talks. But they said, like, in his last days of preaching, going city to city, he would literally get up and say, love your, God, love your Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul, body, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And then he would just go around and kiss and hug people. Mm-hmm. And then he said, one guy... Um, who was following him, following him, kind of being his, like this caddy or his like armor bearer almost. He asked me, said, why, you know, everybody come and see you, you know, you know, to preach the gospel and hear you, you know, preach a sermon. And that's all you get up and say. And he responds to say, because if they, they do that, they have done enough. And I, I, I think, I think that shows us that, wow. <laughs> 
Y'all could probably hear Sage. She's okay. She's okay. She's yeah, with her that's nanny. My, that's my baby. Um, say she she cries like somebody's snatching one of her toes off her foot. Uh, yeah, I think that shows us that that the gospel message uh, sometimes we overcomplicate it. Mm. We really overcomplicate it, and we give people way much way more than they need. Now, I'm not mm-hmm. saying that we should go around and <laughs> tell people that, mm-hmm. right? But I do think that John in his older life just understood. Yeah. Just understood that. That's good. Like he like he he sat with it for years and years and years and it's like everything that I've ever said when I when I when I wrote the book of John was all leading up to these two things. Are you are you are you helping people to love their creator with Mm. everything that's in them and are you encouraging people to love their neighbor as themselves which is crazy that's a very encouraging and convicting story but what's crazy is how much like Jesus that response is because even when the disciples not the disciples the Pharisees came to Jesus and they asked him like something about something (laughs) we gonna paraphrase this whole conversation and he said that the law and the prophets hinge on these two commandments yeah love the Lord your God with all your heart mind and soul and love your neighbor as yourself that means that Jesus has taken the entire Old Testament Mm -hmm. and distilled it down into reverence for God and love for neighbor. Yeah. And according to that story, that's exactly what John just did. Yeah, yeah. And and, and, and it's cool. Like, I, I think it's cool to give... Um, I, I, I honestly think that sometimes learning a bunch of information can hinder us when giving the gospel to people. Mm-hmm. Because I think that we become so consumed in all of the things that's in our mind um, and all of the things that we kind of rehearse to say that we become unsensitive to what the Holy Spirit wants us to say. So, so what's the wisdom in that? Because people like me, I, I'm a, I'm a nerd, right? And I'm, I'm leaning into academia. Like I'm, I'm getting a master's. I want to get a PhD at some point. And so there are some of us, and I think most of us should be more academic yeah, in our sure. pursuit of Scripture. And so, what, what is the wisdom th- then in learning all the truth, but still? Engaging people in a way that is wise and winsome. Yeah, because does that make sense? Absolutely. I, but by no means am I knocking knowledge and wisdom and and be, being an academic. Like I, I think all of that is good. Like when I was in seminary, like I learned so much and I came out like, man, I got so much to give people. And then one of the things that I realized early on is that I knew scripture. But did I, you graduate? I did not graduate. How many credit hours you got? I don't even remember. We should research that. Because, you know, you could, like, if you wanted to finish your degree, you can get your credit hours transferred. Yeah. You shouldn't waste it. You shouldn't waste all that effort. Yeah. You don't want to do that? Maybe. We should pray about it. Maybe. We should pray about it. Yeah. But uh, one of the things that I learned, uh, what was I saying? You were, you came out with a lot of information. Yeah, I came out with a lot of information, but I didn't know how to, like, the information kind of detached me from people. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know how to engage with people Mm -hmm. anymore. And, uh, you know, and I, and that's why I always say that if, if we find our if we find our identity in the information we know and not the God we know, we'll end up treating people like projects instead of image bearers. And so, you know, when I used to do the evangelism, you know, um, course for the Legacy Conference, the 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 biggest people I had problems with, you know, when I would lead teams is people who was in seminary or who just finished seminary, because they was just so it's it's so much information and you don't you miss you miss things a lot of times when you're giving people so much information and you just miss the fact that they said that the church hurt them. Mm-hmm. And so a lot, a lot of times, for example... Can you share that example when you was on, you were watching that thing with the abortion protester? Absolutely. I think that's a word. Yeah, I was watching a, 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 an evangelist um, give the gospel to these women outside of an abortion clinic. And basically they were just saying women should have the right to kill their babies, you know, basically. And um, he kind of came out with the gospel message. A lot of the things that he said, I agree with, right? Um, when it comes to, you know, life starts at, at, at conception. Um, God cares about the babies in the womb. Praise God, right? I, I agree with those things. But one of the th- one of the things that um, one of the ladies said was, "I was raped. Should I keep my child, um, uh, even though I was raped?" And he was like, "Yeah, but 
uh, he, I, he, he responded. I forget what he said, but he said something along the lines is just because you, um, somebody sinned against you, 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 you want to sin against somebody, you want to sin against an innocent baby in the womb. And then he followed that with a scripture. And then she, she kind of like bucked up against it. He was like, no, I have scripture to prove it. And then he gave her this whole theological response. But what he didn't do is stop and acknowledge the fact that she was raped. He didn't pause and say, I'm sorry. Yeah. He didn't pause and say, you know what? God, God saw you. Mm. God cares about you. God, God, God knows what you're, what you're going through. Mm. And like it, right. And so I, that's what I mean by how, how when we have obtained so much knowledge, right? We can become fixated on the knowledge and we be, we can become unsensitive to what the Lord wants us to say. Yeah. And so I think there has to be a balance. And so I think what John did at the end of his life, he didn't rest on his knowledge. He, he rested on what he felt like the Holy Spirit wanted him to say. And I think knowledge gives us a great f- framework for God. I think, you know, the Bible says his people perish, with, you know, because of a lack of it. But at the same time, you want to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And so there have been times where I've given the gospel and I, like somebody said, I worship my ancestors. And all of these scriptures come, you know, about ancestral worship come, come up and then they say something and I don't end up saying none of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, but I end up addressing what made them be, you the, know, root worship, issues. the root issues. Mm-hmm. And so I think the Holy Spirit teaches us how to apply the scriptures to the root issues instead of coming with this script because we have all this knowledge in our head. Yeah, knowledge puffs up, you know, but love builds up. And that's what you really saw John displaying in that story that you shared. It isn't just that he instructed with knowledge or that he leaned into the spirit to give him wisdom, but it was also that he loved because you said that he went down and hugged people, right? Yeah. And so it's like, I think love has to anchor how we engage anybody because we're engaging people. People, people. literally. So like, if I'm called to disciple persons, people, that means that I'm coming into relationships and conversations with a very complex situation. Like, I have a person who has a past, who has a history, who has a personality, who has experiences that have shaped the way that they understand God, themselves, the world, culture, right? Yeah. And knowledge can make you so arrogant where you assume you know what they need. We know what they we know that they need God, right? Yeah. But there are some there are particular ways in which we can serve them to get them there. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And so being curious about what, like even asking them, what do you think about God? Yeah. Instead of just going straight. You get what I'm saying? Like, I remember having this conversation with uh, a student in my class, a fellow student in my class, and he was talking about his father-in-law and he was saying how his father-in-law is a gay man and he was like, how do I just, how do I help him see that his sexuality is wrong? Like, how do I, how do I help him like repent of that and and walk righteously? And I was like, well, you know, when y'all sit down over dinner next time, I was like, ask him what he thinks about God because you want me to give you wisdom to speak specifically to his sexuality. Mm. But the way he walks out his sexuality is indicative of what he thinks about the nature of God. Yeah. And so the nature of God is such a big picture thing. I was like, if you understand what he thinks about God, there are all kinds of things that you could address in addition to the sexuality. Does yeah. he think that God is just? Yeah. He thinks, does he think that he's good? Does he think that he's creator? Because you could talk about Romans 1 and Leviticus 18 all day long, but if you do not establish the lordship of Jesus Christ, it won't get you that far, right? Yeah, for sure. And so I, I just think there, there, there's a sense in which we want to give people Jesus, but the 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 particular way to get them there takes us, us being dependent on the spirit, but also being curious, curious about the people that we're talking to. Yeah, and also too, what I hear you saying is we have to learn how to ask good questions. It's it's imperative. Yeah, yeah. We, 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 Absolutely imperative. Yeah, when we don't ask good questions, um, yeah, like, and, and, and trust that the Holy Spirit will lead you to ask the right questions. Mm-hmm. Um, we miss so much. And I think a lot of times we feel like the knowledge that we obtain is sufficient enough to change someone. And this is like, I've given you all of this theology and you still, and this is like, no, like God probably wants you to ask a particular question that will spark something. When Jesus walked up 
and ask the woman at the well, where's your husband? He knew what he was trying. He knew the end goal, right? Mm -hmm. And so he didn't come up and just start pouring theology on her. He asked her a particular question to help expose the, 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 her heart, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what asking good questions does. It helps people come up with their own conclusions uh. without you being accusatory, without you trying to th stuff scripture down their throat. But also I think it just helps you serve. Like when you ask good questions, you help people to talk. So, and, and you, and you, and you actually, um, what, what am I trying to say? You, you help people teach you how to give them the gospel. That's good. Right. And so it's like asking good questions, like literally, and then listening when you ask a question. Yeah. Not listening Be for a response, but listening. Because it helps you understand what they are so you can serve them better. The curiosity can't be, I'm going to say it this way. Let me say it real strong. Curiosity can't be a strategy. Yes. It has to be a sincere desire. Yes. And so when there's, because even Paul says somewhere, like, love with sincerity. Like, if it's just a strategy, then you're only asking the question to set them up. Yep. But if it's sincere, it's because you want to know them. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Like, I'm not, I'm not going to ask you how you're doing just to do it. It's, how are you? Yeah. And I'm going to sit and wait for you so that I can respond accordingly. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Because I, I, I think what we're both getting at is the like to how you engage people well? It, you gotta love people. Yeah, like yeah. you just have to. Yeah, absolutely. And I and I want to say this, like, because I think some people might hear that and say, "Well, are we doing this to give them the gospel? Are we trying to, you know?" And I I do think it's a difference between setting people up, um, so you can give them this pitch or like asking questions so in the end goal you can give them what they need and so I, I, I do think it's a difference but I, I, I think when we ask good questions because we like truly care about people what you're saying and like concerned about their, their well-being we will listen and we will respond and, and, and like literally serve a need because mm -hmm. a lot of times for example I, yeah, that probably might confuse people but I'll give you an example um, the lady who worshipped her ancestors when she told me that she worshipped her ancestors and I, she was just so rude at first and I was like okay I don't know how to give the gospel to this lady right. and when she said she worshipped her ancestors the thing that popped in my head was, okay, I'm going to go to Leviticus. I'm going to go to um, <laughs> Deuteronomy. De De Deuteronomy. It was so many scriptures that popped into my head. Mm -hmm. But when I saw that she was rejecting scripture, I felt like the Lord was saying, she knows this. She just hates what she knows. Mm -hmm. What do you do now? Mm -hmm. And what, what, I, what I felt like, I felt the Lord like leading me to ask her questions. And I was like, why do you have this 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 heart like what, like what's what's there? And then that's when she opened up and said, you know, um, I was a part of the church, um, you know, and uh, they 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 uh, they betrayed me. And I was like, how did they betray you? Uh, well, they told me my, my molestation was my fault. Oh, okay, you mm. were molested. Mm. Okay, mm. Um, how old were you when you when, when this happened? If you don't mind me asking, I was X Y Z. Okay, now I can talk to. You. So after that, you know, I was like, okay, I'm so sorry that happened to you. And then she was like, I don't need your, I don't need your empathy. But let me ask you, since you were Christian, was it God's fault? Um, I mean, was it my fault that I was molested? Because that's what every Christian told me, mm. right? That's what the that's what my old church told me. So was it God's fault that I was molested? Was it God's fault that that um, I didn't have a good relationship with my mother? And I said, then I said, Lord, <laughs> I don't know. What to say? Help it. Help and I it. and I remember saying, "Lord, help me." Yeah. And I felt like the Lord was saying, "I felt like the Lord said at that moment, share Jackie's testimony." Mm. And I was like, "You know what? I I know you don't want my empathy, mm -hmm. but I'm truly sorry. Mm. You know. And I want to just tell you about my wife and her experience and what she went through. Yada yada yada. And I told her about your story. And even though she was, I, I was a man. That that couldn't empathize with her in the way that 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 I that I could because I I didn't I never went through that experience and she was hard um, towards me at first. When I shared your story, she softened up in a way. Yeah, I saw her I saw her become soft mm. and she was like, "I'm sorry that 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 happened to your wife. Mm. 
I know, I know what it feels like, yada, yada, yada. And then I was able to give her the gospel mm. through your testimony. Yeah. But I want you, I want, I want to tell you about a God mm. who I believe deserve your worship other than your ancestors. Because look what God did with my wife. Mm. My wife has wrote a book called X Y Z. God had literally took my wife through all of this stuff, all of this pain, yada yada, because because um, um, for, for his glory. And not only that, he was concerned about my wife. Mm. He saw that happen to my wife. Mm. He hated it. And not, and not only that, he hated the fact that that happened to you. Yeah. God saw that and he was not pleased. Yeah, And so I was able to give the gospel mm -hmm. through your testimony mm -hmm. and not just... And so what, what would have happened if I just would have gave her all of the scriptures about... S, 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 like, you would have filled her mind and not reached her heart. Absolutely. I think that's what I'm trying to say. And so the asking, but it, it only happened because I asked a good question. Yeah. And so, you know. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, when you look at, when you look at the Bible, the way God dealt with the prophets, with the people, the way Jesus dealt with the, the Pharisees, even his own disciples, he asked a lot of questions because questions can also be instruction. Mm -hmm. And so for me, when I'm discipling or walking with somebody or even in conversation, like a ministry conversation with some people, I may see or discern something and I will ask them a question to bring them to that point. Because a lot of times it is better to help help people reach a conclusion than to just teach them the conclusion. That's good. So, That's really good. Can I ask you a question though, babe? Yeah. Um, what would you say to the people who feel like, who feel this pressure? Because I see this a lot in our society over the last couple of years who feel like they have to like appeal to the culture in a particular way in order to like give people the gospel. Like they have to like, they kind of take that scripture, become all things to all men, like Paul did as to say, oh, I got to speak their language. I got to, I got to, you know, be like them in, in you know that can lean unhealthy in some yeah. ways yeah so that's first corinthians 9 that is often referenced where paul says to the jews i became as a jew in order to win jews to those under the law i became as one under the law though not my not being myself under the law that i might win those under the law like i be i become all men to reach all men kind of thing um Paul was very clearly saying that he knows how to navigate cer certain um, environments where he will, you know, how do I say it? Like he, he would go to the synagogue, he would fast, he would be under certain vows. Like he was still, even though he wasn't under the law, submitted yeah. to the law, but not under the law, he would still do what the Jews would do who were under the law. Mm -hmm. I don't think that makes, it's hard to ex explain what I, I'm saying. Yeah, I think what you're basically saying is that that he, um, he didn't become exactly like them, but he understood the culture that he was right. that he was in right. in order to reach them. I think that is different than saying, hey, I don't know how to say it without saying. But just say it. <laughs> I think that's different than being worldly to reach the world, right? Yeah. Like you, you being carnal or being... Um, just highly liberal. I actually think that's unwise because what is the appeal of Jesus if we're not walking like Jesus to people who don't know him? Yeah. Right? Yeah, like, absolutely. Like, like how, how can I tell you about the holiness of Jesus and the righteousness? How can I be a light mm -hmm. if I'm not actually being a light? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and so it, it, it feels like a very... It feels like a very fleshly way to engage people. It does. And, 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 and to some degree, it feels like a way to please people. Yeah. It's like, it's like, it's a, and it, it, that might be an assumption, but it feels like, are you afraid to actually just be righteous in how you preach the gospel? Yeah. Like, do you feel like that might, it, is that intimidating no, I, to you? I, I, yeah, I think for some that, I think that can be the temptation, but I think for some people, I think some people really think that that that's how they reach people. It's kind of like you, you know, I have to show them that I'm, I relate to them. But again, that's us putting. Uh, uh, that's putting. We're putting too much burden on. I agree. On what we do versus the gospel we preach and the power of God. Because at the end of the day, nobody can 
raise the dead. Yeah. We, we cannot raise the dead. If, if we really believe that an element of the gospel is that we are born in sin, shaped in iniquity, and that we are dead in sin, yeah. then that means that technically, if God doesn't bless this gospel that I preach, then people won't raise from the dead anyway. That's good. And so it's like, even when it's talking about curiosity, talking about love, we're, we're called to preach the gospel, but it's the spirit of God that attends the preaching of the gospel to resurrect people. And so I don't think the Holy Spirit is going to bless things that are actually antagonistic to his nature. Yeah, right? because he, And so I'm already putting people in a very bad position to think that, oh, if I engage with you through worldly means, that'll draw you. No, he, he draws people in a holy way. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Because even when we saw Paul engage with culture, um, like he would do things like quote their poets. Right. Um, but he quoted their poets to point to Jesus. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't just engage in all of the things that they did so that he can, so he can, so he can think, oh, I relate to you now, like me, so I can give you the gospel. Mm -hmm. Like, no, like he quoted their poets to, 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 to say, you know, you guys are, are worshiping statues mm -hmm. and, and things that can't save you. But my God is a God who, who was not created by human hands. Mm -hmm. Right. And so like he, he, he quoted their poets and he quoted these things to point them to somebody greater. Um, he just didn't come in a, cause I tell people all the time, like, I don't believe that God saved me from my culture. Mm. Uh, I believe that God saved me for my culture to reach my culture mm. because culture is not inherently evil, right? But there are things inside the culture that, 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 that goes against the nature of God. And so you have to understand, you have to like ask yourself, am I engaging in things in the culture that goes against the nature of God so I can seem relatable? Mm, mm -hmm. Or am I going, am I Am I a part of this culture that God in his sovereignty saved me from this culture to go inside of this culture to redeem certain aspects of the culture so that I can make God look glorious in a sinful world? It's a Pause. difference. Do you think we should do a part two? Because there's still so much to say. Because I, fe I feel like I need, I feel like we need to get into the subject of sin. Because we're in a world that it, it's becoming harder to engage the culture because we have to address things that might get us fired, that might get us canceled, that might have us losing friendships. Like, is there a way to address sin and wrath that is still gospel centric. So you're trying to say we need to do a part two. I feel like we have to. Okay, part because two. Because what's gonna happen is we're just gonna we're we're not gonna get to 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 some some of the issues that are existing as people is engaging without talking about sin. Part two coming up. <laughs>